So as we look at chapter 5 for the final time, we have this question. Uh, Was God just and merciful in his judgment of Belshazzar? There's no question that the message that comes to Belshazzar is not a warning like the one Nebuchadnezzar had in the dream image of the tree, where he could have responded well or badly and still had an opportunity to repent even when he responded badly. This story, this message written on the wall with the fingers, is a final message of final judgment. There is not going to be an opportunity for Belshazzar to repent and be delivered. But is that just? Why did God do it this way with Belshazzar and not with Nebuchadnezzar and so on? So the message then that comes to Belshazzar is quite interesting and quite layered. So we'll have to make sure we take in the whole thing in order to understand why this is the final message and not a warning message. The first thing is that when when Belshazzar needs uh, the the message read and nobody can read it, the queen mother uh, says to him, because she, of course, has been around for a while in, uh, in the kingdom, and she says, you know, there is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. He's a religious man. He's a devout man. And it turns out uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had made him chief of the Magi. He was hugely influential and a leader. Of course, now he has been marginalized, probably in part because he's Jewish, because we know Belshazzar is an anti-Semite. By the way, he mocks the Jews at the feast. And, um, and he disregards their religion and no doubt thinks they're arrogant and so on uh, with their idea that there's only one true God and all that. So at least we suppose that. And uh, so she tells him about Daniel. And so he has to bring in Daniel. So that's the first thing to note, that Belshazzar has to be told, well, even though you were mocking the Jews and mocking their God, in order to read this message, you're going to need a Jew. In this case, Daniel. And you know, Daniel's name, Daniel, if you didn't know this, Daniel, two words in Hebrew. El is the word God, and Dani means my judge. God is my judge. Daniel is brought in. And this means that if you're Belshazzar, you know, you had the truth right before you in the Jews who were telling you about Yahweh. You simply rejected it and made a mockery of it. But now look, this message has been written in code And you have no idea what God is communicating, and you will need the Jews to interpret it. But you see, that was the whole story. The Babylonians didn't know the true God. It's one of the reasons God sent the Jews into exile in Babylon, to communicate to them the message of God and to be dependent upon the Jews for interpreting that message. That's what Nebuchadnezzar had done, and in the end, Nebuchadnezzar had converted, but not Belshazzar. So he's, you see, Daniel is, is, is a witness against Belshazzar. He's evidence against the lack of repentance, the lack of humility by Belshazzar. And then it gets worse because the queen mother, uh, uh, or rather Daniel comes in and he begins to tell uh, uh, Belshazzar the story of his father. He says, O king, The Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship. And he begins to tell the story of Nebuchadnezzar and how God humbled Nebuchadnezzar when his spirit was hardened. And he dealt proudly while he was uh, uh, on his throne and so on. And he was driven from children of mankind. He was, uh, his mind was made like that of a beast. His dwelling was with wild donkeys. And you remember uh, what's, uh, oops, uh, what's going on here, that um, that uh, Belshazzar, th- this is the story of chapter 4 of Daniel. Because remember that in chapter 4, we had Nebuchadnezzar's own account, an account in his own words of his own story. So that had been published for all Babylonians to read. And of course, Belshazzar could have read the account of Nebuchadnezzar's experience with God and how he was brought 
to be humbled and then to repent and then to be shown mercy and then for his kingdom to be even more glorious afterwards and how he now worshiped Yahweh, the true and living God. So Belshazzar had all of this. In fact, Daniel says very specifically to him, you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. You knew this and you still didn't repent and humble yourself. So Belshazzar, you have had not just a witness from the Jews, but from your very own people, the Babylonians, and important people like Nebuchadnezzar, the former king. You had his testimony, and you knew all this, and you still rejected it. You see, this is why he doesn't need another warning. He's already had plenty of evidence. And it's worth noting, by the way, that here we have an example in the Bible of a writing, okay? We have the writing of the account of Nebuchadnezzar. And God holds Belshazzar accountable for the writing, for knowing what is widely available in the writing. And that writing has now been incorporated into the larger book of Daniel. Like all the writings of the Old Testament and the New Testament, God holds people accountable for what's in these writings. They bear witness. And people who have had access to them and could read them and hear about them and reject them are then held accountable for what they knew and also what they could have known and responded better to. Now, what happens next is um, another part of the message is that Belshazzar is going to make a promise, okay? Uh, it's uh, um, uh, up here, of course. He says um, that if uh, you can read the writing and make known its interpretation, this is Belshazzar speaking, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck. Let's just stop there. Money, wealth, you see? He, he see his God is wealth. So wealth can solve this problem. You, I'll give you whatever money it takes for you to interpret what's written on that wall. Then I can know what's the future, and I can alter the future, you see. He thinks it's an, a warning, and if you have money, you can escape whatever the warning of the judgment is. You can escape it because you have the money, you see. He's put all his chips on the money. And you shall be third ruler in the kingdom. He uses his money to buy power or a position of power. All right, and notice what Daniel says. Let your gifts be to yourself and your rewards to another. Why does Daniel say that? Well, because the promises of Belshazzar at this point are utterly worthless because his money isn't good anymore. The, his empire is going to end the next day. So he's going to die by the morning. He has no power to give, make someone third ruler. Whatever money he gives can just be taken away. So all of his wealth, all that he has trusted in, is now utterly worthless. It has no power. He just doesn't know it yet. But Daniel knows it. And so Daniel, speaking for God, says, You've made the money your God, and it's now worthless. You can just keep it. Nobody cares about it. Nobody will want it. Right? It, it offers nothing to you. So uh, the, the next thing, of course, the big thing, is that uh, he has to interpret what's written, the Mene Tekel Parson. Now, just for clarity, uh, these are what you call weights and measures. It would be the equivalent of seeing something like this, pounds and like a dollar sign written, uh, or, or, and then a divided sign for parsing, which is a division, divided sign. Okay, so that's what he saw, something like this on the, on the actual wall. He just didn't know what it meant. And what he's told, of course, is that he has been weighed in the balances and found wanting. He's been measured. He's been valued. Do you see? He put a value on what? On money. Money is the most valuable thing. But in the meantime... By the way, religion wasn't the most valuable thing. God was cheap. God wasn't worth anything, not in the real world. But now God is putting a value on him. 
God is measuring him, and it's a true measure, and it's the ultimate measure. Belshazzar thought he was a man of substance and wealth and power and prestige, pageantry, but in reality, he was empty and lacking. He was just a, a, a helium balloon. All right, and so you then have this, after he's told all this message, notice what it says. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple, and a chain of gold was put around his neck, and a pro proclamation was made. They made a proclamation. They went through the formal declaration publicly that he would be third ruler in the kingdom, even though he's just been told by the dividing sign, right? He's One of the things that's been interpreted to him is that his his uh, the days of your kingdom have been brought to an end, okay? Parsi, your kingdom is divided. So, uh, the kingdom is worth nothing anymore, but he still, because this is all he has at this point, he has nothing else that he's put a value on. So what does he do? He just goes through the sterile ritual, the pageantry, the public declaration, give the money over, even though he's on the very precipice of hell itself. This is all that he is at this point. It's become who he is. He has nothing. He is empty and vacuous and vain. And that very night, he is killed and the Babylonian Empire ends. But guess who lived? Daniel. Daniel was still living because Daniel had put his value on something else. So that's the first half of the book. As we turn to the second half of the book, a focus becomes uh, not the city of Babylon, but the city of Jerusalem. If you read each of the stories in the second half of the book, the focus of those stories is not so much the city of Babylon anymore, but will be the city of Jerusalem, its temple, and its saints, its citizens who occupy it. And the question as we turn into chapter 6, as we turn the corner into chapter 6, um, right off the bat, as you read the chapter, what is being critiqued? What cultural feature is being critiqued? Yes, it will incorporate, in, incorporate the pagan Gentile culture still, but it will now be set uh, in more uh, clear uh, relief against the city of Jerusalem. So what exactly is being critiqued? Uh, and the key to understanding what's being critiqued is to notice that the Persians under Darius will do something that the Babylonians never did. As bad as the Babylonians were to the Jews at times, in the first half of the book, the Persians actually prove to be worse. So, best wishes and we'll see you next time.